before we start the video and update. My earlier R5 review had a problem with the 8K video raw stopping after only 30 seconds. It turns out that was just a problem with the CF Express card I was using. Any other CF Express card other than this pro grade Cobalt version should be just fine. Also, a warning, the video you're about to watch is going to give you some gear acquisition syndrome. You might just want to upgrade to this R5 because the image quality results are pretty stunning. And when you do, you'll be left with some old gear that you aren't using. You should go to KEH.com and sell it to them and get some cash. In fact, sell them any old gear that you're not using that much. You might also want to get some better gear. KEH has the world's greatest supply of used gear and everything is carefully inspected. If something doesn't work out the way you want, you have a 14 day window to return it and a 180 day guarantee where they'll fix it if something goes wrong. So there's really no risk to you. KEH is worldwide. You can check them out at this link and use the coupon code TNC20 to get 5% off any purchases. Thanks KEH and now onto our image quality comparison. Do you want the good news first or the bad news first? The the good news. Okay. All right. I mean, free, just don't even, don't even worry about the bad news. We'll just first, let's look at pictures from the R5 and the Sony a7R Mark IV. The a7R Mark IV is a little bit less of an expensive camera, but it has 60 megapixels. Maybe more importantly, it lacks an AA filter. So might be a little bit sharper. Let's see. First, I'll say I'm using Lightroom Classic to compare these. All of these are taken from RAW files. And then I have applied a very small amount of sharpening and noise reduction, similar to the bare minimum that you would do on any sort of real world images. I've scaled them to similar resolutions so that we can see uh, it's one to one what they look like. I'm always scaling up to match the higher resolution image. And the first thing that I noticed looking at these two pictures is that the Sony on the left here and the Canon on the right have different colors. And if you'll look behind me, the actual color here is more towards the Canon. Now, I did a whole video about color science and it's worth a watch because there are big differences between manufacturers, but I found the only real difference was how they calculated the automatic white balance. So these two cameras looked at this particular scene and did the white balance differently. And so that's why the two colors are so different. This is pretty easily fixed in post. And we found in our poll, when we fixed the white balance, nobody could distinguish between any manufacturer's cameras. Let's zoom into four to one to check the detail. Why four to one? That's ridiculous because you might be watching this in 4K on a big monitor, but other people are watching this on a little smartphone and they won't be able to see the details unless I over zoom. So we're going in real type, but this doesn't necessarily simulate real world usage. Looking at the details here, by the way, these are taken with the exact same lens. I do not see much difference in detail at all. Maybe there is a tiny bit crisper image quality out of the Sony with its slightly higher megapixels and lack of AA filter, but there's no part of this scene where it's not easily readable on both. And in the out of focus background, even though it's monochromatic at their base ISO, there's really no visible noise at all. Even in the sort of deeper shadows, everything looks fine. This is good news for the Canon. It means you're not gonna miss those extra megapixels. In fact, it'll actually make the storage a little bit cheaper. It'll make your workflow a little bit easier because the files will be a little bit smaller. We found this same result when we compared the 42 megapixel A7R Mark III to the 60 megapixel A7R Mark IV. That extra like, 15, 17, 18 megapixels doesn't really make a difference in the real world. Let's jump right up to ISO 51,200. Zooming in here to look at the details, like to my eye, the Canon looks way better. Like look at the word video book here and video is just completely lost here. Like look at this P, which is quite visible here and is just completely lost on the Sony on the left. Just throughout the whole scene, like look here at her face versus how her face is rendered on the Canon. I can't believe I'm saying this, but the Canon has better high ISO than the Sony. This is actually a solid win for any low light photographer. You can get the R5 and you'll be getting the best image quality out there because the a7R4 was our low light image quality winner before. I know there's this stigma around high megapixel cameras at high ISOs, but in the real world, when images are scaled, we don't find that to be a problem at all. Let's zoom out and I wanna show you something else. This is not related to the high ISO. This is related to the fast shutter speed. I use the shutter speed of 1 8,000 to simulate low light conditions to keep the lighting consistent. 
Both of these cameras are using their electronic front curtain shutters with a rear mechanical shutter. But the problem is the a7R4 actually has some visible banding. You can see these purple lights behind me. They flicker a little bit. It's invisible to my eye. It's invisible to this video camera. At high shutter speeds, that fast flickering actually shows up on some sensors because the entire sensor isn't red at the same time. And on the Sony, that becomes significant at this fast shutter speed. At the Canon, well, you can see it a little bit, but it's not nearly as distinct. It's much smoother. Well, who would care about this? If you're shooting at a very short shutter speed under artificial lighting, especially in uncontrolled environments, this could be a problem. The typical scenario is indoor sports. We'll talk more about banding a little bit later. It's gonna be important. Now let's compare the dynamic range between the A7R4 and the R5. What I've done here is to take those raw photos and then raise the exposure by five stops so that we can see into the shadows. Whenever I do this, there's always somebody snarky in the comments being like, no real photographer would ever miss the exposure by five shots. I nail the focus and, and exposure and everything, every time, because I'm me, I'm so awesome. I don't need to worry about dynamic range. Here's why professionals care about dynamic range. Yes, sometimes professionals make mistakes, and if the camera captures so much dynamic range that you can fix it in post, great. Because professionals are often thinking about many different things at the same time. They're not entirely focused on the exposure triangle, but that's not really it. In the real world, there are so many beautiful, extremely high dynamic range scenes that cannot simply be captured in a single proper exposure. A big one for landscape photographers is shooting into the sunrise or sunset. This also happens with moonrise photography. I did moonrise photography and I had to raise the shadows as much as I possibly could. There was no way to properly expose the moon and the foreground subject in this scene. In these ways, great dynamic range makes a tangible improvement for many different types of photographers, especially landscape photographers, but it's a big deal for wildlife photographers too. Let's look at the base ISO and see how these compare. Let's zoom into the reflection on this monitor. Here we can see the A7R4 did a much better job of recovering those hidden shadows. On the R5, the shadows are much noisier. To recap, the R5 versus the A7R4 at very high ISOs, low light conditions, the R5 was a little bit better, but it wasn't a huge difference. In recovered shadows, simulating dynamic range, the A7R4 was noticeably better than the R5. Let's move on and compare the R5 against the 5D Mark IV. This is the final DSLR that Canon is making, I think. I kind of wish they would make a 5D Mark V, and a lot of existing Canon shooters are going to think about upgrading. Will they be giving up anything in image quality? Let's find out. At ISO 100, the R5 looks significantly better than the 5D Mark IV. This isn't a surprise because the 5D Mark IV always lagged behind the competition. Look at how video book is rendered on the older 5D Mark IV versus the new R5. Part of this is going to be the jump to 45 megapixels. This means that you're gonna be taking a little more time to transfer your pics. You're gonna be spending a little bit more on storage, but it pays off in better image quality. Let's check the noise at ISO 25600. Here the R5's low light capabilities are vastly better than the 5D Mark IV. Just look how much clearer that is. It's really a low light champion. Now let's check the dynamic range. And the good news is the recovered shadows on the R5 actually seem better than the 5D Mark IV. So if you're a wedding photographer and you're always pulling up the shadows in the dark suits, know that by upgrading to the R5, you will get a little bit cleaner shadows. To summarize the comparison between the R5 and the 5D Mark IV, the R5 is noticeably better throughout the entire range. Canon shooters, if you're upgrading, you will get only better image quality. How about comparing it to the 50 megapixel 5DSR? This is a camera I've held on to for shooting landscapes with Canon because they've never made a higher megapixel camera. So let's see how it compares. Once again, the R5 is here on the right. Comparing it to the 5DSR, the 5DSR does actually seem a little bit sharper. 5DSR has two advantages. It's 50 megapixels instead of 45 megapixels, but it also lacks an AA filter. So you can see in some places this is a drawback. Like, look at the little red fringing that you get around here. That's probably caused by moiré. That's not present in the R5, but at the same time, it doesn't have quite the same crispness. So if you are a landscape shooter and you're shooting with the 5DSR, Know that the R5 would be a tiny step back, but not a dramatic step back. Let's check how their image quality compares at higher ISOs. Here, the R5 is actually better. It's still the low light champ. 
it doesn't look quite as crisp, but some of the extra noise in the 5DSR actually makes it appear sharper when it's not. Let's check their dynamic range. Even just at one to one, you can see a dramatic improvement in the dynamic range from the R5 over the 5DSR. This is probably gonna mean a lot to landscape photographers more than that tiny little bit of extra detail that we got at the base ISO. Being able to recover those shadows and have them be clean is really nice for those times when you can't bracket your shots. Therefore, landscape photographers, I would suggest you go ahead and upgrade to the R5, especially because that new 24 to 70 and 70 to 200 f 28 RF lenses are absolute magic. We'll give you a full comparison of the DSLR lenses versus the RF lenses soon. To summarize the R5 versus the 5DSR, the 5DSR does have a tiny detail advantage at the base ISO, but it disappears as you start to use higher ISOs. When you pull up that dynamic range, the R5 actually looks better. Not to mention the R5 is just a modern camera, whereas the 5DSR is now fully outdated. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got an electronic viewfinder, it's got a touchscreen, and all these things that are just missing from the a 5DSR. How does the R5 compare to the R? I would go back and watch the 5D Mark IV part of this comparison. I was going to do it again, but I'm bored, so I'm not going to do it again. But they have basically identical sensors. If you're currently shooting with a Canon EOS R and you would like better image quality, you will get that by upgrading to the R5. In particular, the R5's improved dynamic range helps because we've seen banding in the shadows when recovering them on the EOS R. I found that even in real world, like nighttime shooting conditions. Let's see how the R5 compares to the 20 megapixel R6. Here, the R6 on the left is noticeably less sharp. Of course, jumping from 45 megapixels down to 20 megapixels makes a difference. If you want detail, then of course, you're going to have to upgrade to the R5 from the R6. It's not that the R6's image quality isn't acceptable. 20 megapixels is going to be enough for many. The pro sports photographers have been using the 1DX with that level of detail for the longest time. But if you add extra detail, you're going to get cleaner, sharper pictures. Let's see how they compare at high ISOs. Here, the R5 on the right is still the low light champ. Look how you can read Chelsea here, but it's pretty much illegible on the R6. People say that higher megapixel sensors don't produce good low light images, but that's just not true in my real world testing. They almost always look better than lower megapixel cameras of the same generation. Just one more test between these two, and that is dynamic range. Maybe the R6 has a little advantage, but it's not enough to want to pick one or the other. To summarize the image quality differences between the R5 and the R6, the R5 will produce more detailed images, and the R5 produces better low light images. However, the R5 will increase your storage costs. It'll take you longer to transfer your files. You need to buy the more expensive CF Express cards, etc. Now I want to talk about something really important, and that is the dual mechanical and electronic shutters that are present in the R5. The Canon has advertised two different still frames per second for this camera. The mechanical shutter is 10 frames per second, while the electronic shutter is 20 frames per second. 20 is better than 10, so why would you not use the electronic shutter all the time? I'm going to answer that for you, and it's going to kind of suck. Let's take a look in Lightroom. These two pictures are both taken with the R5 using exactly the same settings. The only thing that changed was I switched from the electronic front curtain shutter, which has a mechanical rear shutter closing off the sensor, to the fully electronic silent shutter. And you can see the difference is dramatic. You have this crazy banding in the background with this electronic shutter. Why do you see the banding in the background and not the foreground? Because the lights that I'm illuminated with now and that we're illuminating these books in the foreground here, these are high quality, expensive lights. They do not flicker. The cheap purple background lights that I chose, the little spots, these are cheap DJ lights and they do flicker. You can't see it, but at faster shutter speeds, you would be able to see it. Now, why is this important? Because a lot of places use flickering lights sports arenas in particular use flickering lights. If you're planning on shooting sports, your kids' sports, professional sports, indoors or outdoors at night with artificial lighting, this is probably going to be an issue. It might not even be an issue in every picture because as we can see, it varies by light. What I've seen before is professional players will be in the center of the field illuminated by the huge stadium lights and there will be no banding with an electronic shutter. But then if they move close where they're illuminated by those advertising banners that you see around the outside, 
those LEDs are full color and they tend to flicker. And then suddenly you get this awful banding and it can actually ruin pictures. And if nothing else, it would be a total pain to process. So this is something you need to be aware of. If you want to shoot over 10 frames per second, you need the electronic shutter. And then suddenly you have to be thinking about the light source or else you're going to get banding. Outside, totally fine. Go ahead and use that electronic shutter. However, you could still get rolling shutter, which is the tiltiness of something. So you should still want to use the mechanical shutter. This is going to mean a lot of people dismiss it right away, especially sports photographers or wildlife photographers who wanted that, that greater than 10 frames per second rate. But it actually gets a little bit worse than that because a lot of people who want that electronic shutter are actually journalists who are shooting things like press events where you've seen the president speaking and he's surrounded by photojournalists and all you hear is bang, 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 bang of the shutter. This is a serious problem that they're trying to do away with. They're trying to mandate silent shutters. This is going to require people to use the electronic shutter and their shutter speeds aren't going to be one eight thousandths. They're probably going to be much slower. They're probably going to be like one one hundredth. Banding is still a problem. Let's look at some other images. Here's clear banding showing at one eightieth of a second on the R5. And it really just gets worse as the shutter speed goes higher and higher. This is it at one one hundredth of a second. Here we are at one one sixtieth of a second. It's very distinct. This is one two hundredth. That's the range of shutter speeds that you're probably going to be shooting those events at, things like portraits. And if it's under artificial lights, which might potentially be flickering, then you could end up with banding in your photos. And especially for a photojournalist, that just might not be workable. Here's the banding at 1 640th of a second. You can see it continues to get more and more distinct as you move up in shutter speeds. This is 1 1000th. And if I'm shooting professional sports, I'm at one two thousandths or above. And you can see what the banding looks like at one two thousandths. The picture is essentially unusable. So if I was shooting my kids, eh, one five hundredth might be okay. That electronic shutter is a problem. I can suggest one workaround and that is to try to find a shutter speed that synchronizes with the flashing lights. So here I am at one five hundredths of a second and you can see the banding has almost completely disappeared. We see low banding at even multiples of 1 1 25th with these particular lights. So here at 1 2 50th of a second, you can see there's really no banding. With these particular lights, I found that they sync at 1 1 25th, 1 2 50th, and 1 500th, eliminating that banding. But if we multiply it again and go up to 1 1000th of a second, you can see the banding appears. So the very fastest I could go was 1 500th of a second. You're not always going to be able to use one five hundredth of a second to eliminate banding because it's going to depend on the lights. Look, if you're shooting in a new auditorium, you might be able to take some sample shots in the lights to see whether there is flickering or not, or to see if a particular shutter speed eliminates that. There's no sure way around it though. And you know, if you're shooting a quiet concert and you want to use this silent shutter to not interrupt people, that could be really difficult in these sorts of artificial lights that they use in concerts. I also found that the electronic shutter introduced much more high ISO noise. So if you are trying to shoot at higher ISOs, definitely stick to the mechanical shutter whenever possible. You can see this is the mechanical shutter on the left and the electronic shutter on the right at ISO 100,000. The same rule applies to dynamic range. Again, the mechanical shutter on the left and the electronic shutter on the right. We can see the dynamic range from the mechanical shutter is far better than the dynamic range on the electronic shutter. The summary of this is that, yes, it is great to have the silent electronic shutter as an option on the R5. That's not something that was available on earlier 5D models, but it comes with severe limitations that could potentially ruin an entire set of photos if you forget to take the light source into account. Some of you are perfect and you won't make a mistake like that, but you know yourselves. A lot of you working pros might think, okay, maybe I need to stick to what I know, the mechanical shutter. I also want to make the point these are not unique to the R5. Every electronic shutter has this to some extent. The best electronic shutter in the industry right now is the Sony A9 Mark II but even it still showed banding at about 1 1 60th and higher. It has one benefit. It has a frequency tuning feature that allows you to very specifically tune in a precise shutter speed. And with these particular lights, I was able to get pretty good results by tuning in a shutter speed of like one over 3,278, something like that synced pretty well. But 
Again, you would have to actually take the time to tune that in before shooting under any individual light source, and that really changes your workflow as a professional. The summary of this video is great news. Canon caught up. They used to be significantly behind Sony and Nikon and Panasonic, but now they're there. They're right in the thick of it. You no longer have to give up image quality if you want to shoot with Canon. Congrats, Canon. This has been a huge leap. I do have to tell you the little caveats that I find. I have to expose everything because I want you to be able to make an educated buying choice. But none of these are deal breakers for most of you. I want you to continue on and make the choices that you want to make and feel good about it. If you have old gear sitting around, send it over to KEH. They will give you a great price for it with none of the hassle of selling on any other type of used market. Trust me, I have sold them like thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of our gear. Gear is constantly moving between me and KEH because they make it so easy. Thank you KEH for making videos like this possible. And don't forget this video takes a lot of effort from me and Chelsea. So please subscribe to our channel so you can see the future updates, including reviews of the EOS R5 used for landscapes and portraits and sports, as well as our reviews of the EOS R6 and the Sony A7 Mark III that I'm filming this on now. Thanks.